meditates upon the frailty of human nature, of our constitution. We're like the flower that flourishes and then it fades. And that is something that Paul also reflects upon in 2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul considers that he himself is a vessel of clay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We will read the entire chapter. Please follow along. We will be meditating on verses 7 through 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to God's word. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke, we also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let us pray for the Lord's blessing on this word. Father, we come and we ask now that you would speak to us through the preaching of your word. We are weak, but you are strong. We are foolish but you are wise. Lord, help us to see this treasure and to know the power that is at work in it, in us. Lord, we pray, keep away distractions, keep away pain, fatigue, concerns about work or family, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would protect us from the way in which Satan would try to snatch this seed before it even hits the ground. We pray, Lord, that you would surround us with an army of angels and let your word do its work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, we continue where we left off last week, picking up at verse 7. And there, Paul speaks a little bit about treasure, or just as a little bit of an, an entry point, if you will. Who doesn't like thinking about treasure? It's no secret in the Fulkerts family that I want to get a metal detector for my birthday because I like to go looking for treasure. That's always the big joke around the table, what to get dad for his birthday, a metal detector. And to my wife's dismay, I had the providential conversation with a minister at Classis who told me all I needed to know about buying a metal detector. He does this, and he has found gold coins and all kinds of treasure. He's even gone to Europe, to England, and he's looked for treasure. So I came home, and I couldn't wait to tell her this story, and she's like, ah. That's the last person you needed to talk to. So, who doesn't like treasure? Jesus knows that even in our nature, there's that, there's that impulse to try to get find something that's precious, that's rare, that's worth something, that you can either tuck it away somewhere as a, as a safety net, or you might be able to sell it and, and buy something else. Paul is is also going to speak about treasure. Paul's treasure is real treasure. It's, it's the best treasure. We're going to be thinking about this treasure this morning. Paul has spoken in verse 1 of chapter 4 about this ministry that he is the apostle of. And he has spoken in verse 4 about this gospel. And now in verse 7 he speaks about this treasure. This treasure, this gospel treasure. Paul continues to defend his new covenant ministry. And as we saw, he's done this already since chapter 1, and it really will continue until chapter 7. As we know, the Corinthians had a hard time with not only Paul's message, but Paul's method. And so we see always the message and the method are one. And, and so that's going to be the case here this morning as Paul here will show how this treasure is planted within an earthen jar, a clay jar. So he's defending his new covenant ministry, showing how God uses suffering to broadcast his gospel. Suffering is the, is the background that allows the treasure to shine with all its beauty. And so... One other little point before we dig in is simply this, that we're looking specifically at Paul and his apostolic ministry. But as I said last week, the life of the apostle is Christian life written large. So what Paul experiences is by uh, uh, application broadens out to us as well. So we also can put ourselves in this text and say, too, that God will use our suffering to showcase the power and beauty of the treasure of the gospel. Let's look at that. We have this treasure in jars of clay. That's my theme. Here's the theme, just a little bit more broadly stated. We're not going to have points in this sermon. One big point, if you will, and this is what it is. God's purpose there's a purpose statement in verse 7, to show. God does this in order to do something else. So this is what the text is about. God's purpose in putting treasure in clay jars is to show the surpassing power of Christ giving life. I'll say that again. God's purpose in putting treasure in clay jars is to show the surpassing power of Christ giving life. We're going to look at that as we dig in. In verses 1 through 6, Paul has shown the glory of the gospel of Christ. That's what we looked at last week, this glorious, transcendent gospel. We see the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus. Now he transitions slightly. We go from the glory of the gospel of Christ to the power of the gospel of Christ. In verses 7 through 12, Paul shows where this gospel is deposited and what its effect is. It is deposited in human hearts, and its effect 
is power. But power for a purpose. We'll hang on to that to the very end. Look at verse 7. Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. This treasure is what Paul has spoken of in verse 4. It is the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's what he then expands upon in verse 6. The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the treasure. It is the glory of God reconciling us to himself in his son Jesus at the cross. That's treasure. That's the very best, most beautiful, most wonderful treasure. It's so expensive, money can't buy it. It's so costly that no human service or sacrifice could ever earn it. It is beyond earning. It is beyond purchase. This treasure, the only way it can be received is if it is given as a gift. This treasure... This treasure, as Paul has explained in verse 4 and verse 6, is the gospel that shines with glory. Imagine if you could find the most precious diamond, the, the biggest precious gem, and the light of the sun is just sparkling off of it. That's the gospel. That's the treasure. Jesus once expanded upon this in a broader concept, saying in Matthew chapter 13, that the kingdom of heaven is a treasure. See, these are just concepts that, that give us all the different angles of this treasure. Paul in Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 will speak about Christ himself as the treasure. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ Jesus, the Son of God, atoning for our sin, making it so that we can be adopted as God's sons and daughters, gaining for us an eternal inheritance in a new world, purchasing for us the very righteousness of God, all those things and more besides. It's this treasure that Paul is speaking about. Already in chapter 3, we've seen various components of this treasure. This gospel in the new covenant gives life. It gives freedom, it gives transformation, it gives heaven. This treasure, the gospel of Jesus in you, planted within you, saving you, rescuing you, healing you, restoring you, making you truly and at last finally human, restoring the image of God within you, that's a treasure, isn't it? It's extravagant. The Corinthians needed to know what a treasure the gospel is. They looked at it and shrugged their, sh their shoulders. It seemed so plain, ordinary. It wasn't fanciful. It didn't glimmer. It was rather disenchanting for them. Paul says, this gospel that I've spoken to you about, this glorious Christ dying on the cross for you and rising from the grave for you and entering heaven for you and interceding at God's right hand for you, this Christ is your treasure. They needed to see that and we need to see that. Do you know that the gospel is a treasure? Boys and girls, that's why your mom and dad took you to church this morning. Because the gospel is the very best thing in all the world. You know, Jesus spoke about treasure. He says, what will a man do if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? People say, oh, that's treasure, and that's treasure, that's treasure. And Jesus says, that's not treasure. Jesus is saying, I am your treasure. I am the thing that is of inestimable value. If you have Christ, you have everything. You have treasure.
Well, Paul says that God has placed this treasure in jars of clay. Now, back then, of course, they didn't have banks where you could just put your money in a safe deposit box and come get those precious coins or or, uh, necklaces whenever you wanted. What did they do with their treasure if they wanted to keep it safe? They would take a clay jar, something ordinary that didn't look any different from anything else on the shelf, and they'd put all their money in it, and they'd probably hide it somewhere, maybe underneath a floorboard or under a bed, or maybe they would bury it out in the backyard somewhere by a tree, something where they could identify it. That's how they would protect their wealth. Well, Paul says, God's taken this treasure of Jesus and his gospel, and he's putting it in us. Where are the clay jars? Now, this is a very interesting and a very specific point that Paul wants to make. When you think about a clay jar, what are we thinking of? We're thinking of something that's very common, ordinary. It's, um, it's fragile. If you drop it, it will break. And it's cheap. You can buy them by the dozen. They're made every day in the marketplace. I think uh, by analogy today, we don't really use clay jars, but if this was written today, you, Paul might have said, but we have this treasure in a cardboard box, something that can be crushed. You know, I got a delivery this week from Christian Book Distributors, and the box was destroyed. Thankfully, my books were okay. We're all all right. But a cardboard box is not durable and it will disintegrate and decompose, just like a clay jar. So what Paul does is he uses something so ordinary, so common, so fragile, so cheap, and he says that's, that's who we are. And of course, you see there's even another layer to this illustration because clay jars are made out of dirt, and we are made out of dirt as well. We are creatures of dust. So it's a very good analogy. And in this way, Paul is demeaning himself. He really is. He's putting himself down. He saw himself as common, cheap, and fragile, as possessing no intrinsic worth. He's a creature of dust. He is merely a humble, redeemed mortal. You see, Paul's point is this. The Corinthians thought that the gospel should make you intellectually superior. The gospel should make you socially superior. The gospel should advance you in culture and society. The gospel should elevate you, but Christ is saying, no, you have it all wrong. The gospel should bring you low. He consistently says that in his teachings. If a king makes a poor beggar a prince, he will dress him in royal robes, won't he? Not God. The royal treasure of heaven is deposited into clay jars. That's Paul's point, that the gospel... There is no health and wealth gospel. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no gospel of social advancement. The gospel that Jesus preached is one of lowliness. He himself took the place of a servant and washed the disciples' feet. So Paul's point here is that God tucks away the glory of Christ inside clay jars. Us, Paul, the Corinthians. Now, why does, tuck the go- why does God tuck the gospel, the glory of Christ shining inside our clay jars, our hearts, our bodies? Even as we think of clay jars here, we're thinking not only of, our, of the gospel indwelling our heart, but clay jar refers to Paul's life, as we'll see in the verses to follow. So you're not just thinking of your physical flesh, but you're thinking of your life that God has planted the gospel in you, in your heart, in your life. Now, why does he do that? Paul says here, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul drills down to the core of gospel ministry, to the very heart and soul of what ministering is, and he, he alters the illustration ever so slightly When we think of treasure, we typically think of wealth. We think of money. We think of precious uh, gems and and gold and things like that. When Paul thinks of, of treasure, he thinks of power. And we can we can see this transition ourselves because, for example, if you have wealth, 
You do have power. You can buy whatever you want, and you can do things with your money. So wealth does translate into power. Uh, We also just think here of verse 6, where Paul is speaking about this treasure as knowledge, knowledge of God's glory. And we know that knowledge is power. If we, we know how to harness electricity, we can do all sorts of things. We know laws of nature and physics, and we can put a man on the moon. So, so knowledge is power. Wealth is power. And Paul here uses this treasure in this light to say that this treasure works powerfully. It works effectually with a surpassing power within us. That word surpassing is uh, the Greek word hyperbole. So we take this right into English, directly into English. Hyperbole is a statement of speech that's exaggerated. It's exaggerated speech. It means literally to throw beyond, you know, to hit the ball out of the stadium. That's hyperbole. It is the state of having extremely, even superlatively, more than is necessary. So isn't that glorious? This power that this treasure unleashes is a hyperbole power. It is a power that is excessive. It's extremely more than is necessary. And then let's look at the other word power. Language is kind of fun because they're, they're like tools. Some guys like to take apart engines. Well, uh, you can do that with words. Power is the Greek word dynamis. Of course, you know what that sounds like. That sounds like dynamite, exactly the word transferred over into English. So the Greek word dynamis is our English word dynamite. So we're talking about an excessively powerful dynamite. This is heaven's dynamite forged in the factory of heaven. So God is saying here that this gospel is divine dynamite within your soul. We don't always feel that way, but... We'll talk about that. But isn't that wonderful? God's surpassing dynamite is embedded within the very character of the gospel, within the very, within the very heart of Christ. And, and Christ is in us when we believe in him. So, so here's the point. God made his apostle weak. He made him a jar of clay so that the superpower hidden within him might be seen by others. If Paul was a super apostle, now we're going to get to that later on in this this book, the super apostles, guess what? That word super apostle is the same word hyper. So you got the hyper apostles, and then you got the, the weak clay vessel apostle. But in him is hyper power. So God makes him a jar of clay, cheap, no intrinsic worth, play vessel, fragile, breakable, in order that God's dynamite might be displayed in his weakness. If he was a super apostle, nobody could see the treasure hidden inside of him. If he was a jar of clay, people would see that the surpassing power in Paul was not from Paul. It was not of Paul. It was divine. As he says in verse 7, he says, when I'm a jar of clay, then people can see that the treasure in me that works with surpassing power belongs to God. It's God's power at work in me. What a treasure. What a treasure. So let's look at this. What Paul does in verses 8 through 11 is he shows us He illustrates what this actually looks like in his life. Paul was a clay jar. You see in verse 8, he was afflicted. He was perplexed, persecuted, struck down, always carrying in in his body death, the death of Jesus, always being given over to death. Afflicted means he was oppressed, he he suffered hardship. We can think of all the times that he was imprisoned and he was whipped and he was shipwrecked and he was stoned and he was imprisoned. Perplexed means to be at a loss, dumbfounded, confused. 
grasping at straws. And persecuted, of course, we, we know that. We see that clearly in Paul's life. Struck down, that's a very a vivid word. He was cut down as if someone had just taken an axe to his feet and cut them off from underneath him. Always carrying in the body the death. Death here in the verse 10 refers to the deadness. Really the word deadness. Carrying in the body the deadness of Jesus. Each description that Paul gives here intensifies the previous description. You can see that here in your text. Afflicted. And then intensified beyond that. Perplexed at a loss. Despairing or but not driven to despair. Persecuted. And finally, struck down, laid low, and then at last, carrying deadness within his soul. This is, as I said, a letter on suffering. If you turn back to chapter 1, just so you see this with your eyes. At chapter 1, at verse 4, he speaks about his affliction. He says in verse 5 that he shares in Christ's sufferings. He says in verse 8 that, that he is utterly burdened beyond strength. He despairs of life. Verse 9, he receives a sentence of, of death. We can't even imagine what this was like for Paul. How many times didn't he think this is it? And we see in chapter 2, the triumphal procession. He's being led to his martyrdom in the arena. We see the text before us in chapter 4. Uh, verses 14 through 17. We see also furthermore in chapter 6 at verses 3 through 10, a long list of these sufferings of beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, and hunger. You see all of that. You can turn then to chapter 11, verse 23. You'll see another catalog. Here he is, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times he received from the Jews 40 lashes less one. Most people died on the first time, and Paul endured it five times. And then you can turn ahead to chapter 12 as well, where Paul here speaks about the thorn in the flesh in verses 9 and 10. His weaknesses, his insults, his hardships, his persecutions and calamities. I, I really think Paul gives Job a run for his money in terms of the sufferings that Paul endured. The point is, is God made him a clay jar. You know who else said that they were clay? It was Job. Job and Paul are kindred spirits. And Job said to God, remember that you have made me like clay, and will you return me to the dust? God humbled Job and brought him low so that God's power could be seen. That's what you see in the last four chapters of the book of Job is God's power. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? God's power. This holy, divine treasure was put within Paul's clay jar and it worked powerfully. So let's look at that. It worked terrifically. He says, I was afflicted in every way, but not crushed, not distressed hopelessly, not beyond hope. He says, I was perplexed, but not driven to despair, to be in doubt of God's faithfulness and God's character and God's goodness. He says, I was persecuted, but not forsaken. He didn't abandon me. He didn't turn his back on me. He's always been there, faithful and true. He says, I was struck down. My, my legs were chopped off beneath the knees. I was laid low, but I was not destroyed. He said, I continually carry within my soul the deadness of Jesus. Yet the life of Jesus swells up from within and comes out. You see, there's power there, isn't there? There is effective power emanating from the gospel. The power of this treasure within Paul kept him from disintegrating 
That's what we see. It's thus far and no further, and thus far and no further. And in Paul's life and ministry, there's constantly this cycle of being beaten and then rising up, of being stoned and then rising up, of being put in prison and coming up, and being whipped and rising up, and again and again and again and again and again is the life of the apostle. He could be afflicted, but he would not be crushed. He could be persecuted, but he would not be driven to despair, or perplexed, but not driven to despair. He could be persecuted, but he would not be forsaken. He could be struck down, but he would not be destroyed. Because the gospel within him that he has embraced that he has inhaled and digested, communicated power, surpassing divine dynamite. But that divine dynamite, surpassing power, can only best be seen when the apostle is weak. The stars never stop shining, but you only see them when the sky is dark. If anybody will receive the gospel, he must be conformed to it. If anyone will come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. As a visual in your mind, see Jesus carrying the beam of the cross to Golgotha and see yourself five steps behind carrying your own beam. You're following him to the place where you will be crucified. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. You will go with him to Calvary, and there, brothers and sisters, you must die with him. A cruciform apostle preaches a cruciform Christ. The message and the messenger become one. That's God's method. And when he makes the apostle weak, he is able to show to the world the transforming power of Jesus. God makes us weak so that the world may see the transforming power of him who died for us and rose victorious from the grave. It's important that we see these two things together, the one inside of the other. The treasure is where the power is. In Paul, Paul is a clay jar. This is important. Christianity is no self-help, do-it-yourself, believe-in-yourself, humanistic claptrap. Paul is a clay jar. He hasn't persevered by sheer determinism. He has not succeeded by the stiff upper lip. He has not embraced Stoic philosophy. That doesn't hurt me. I will keep going. But inside of him, inside of you, is a treasure emanating life. Powerful, God-enabling, God-creating, God-sustaining life. Look at it like this. Here's an analogy. It's like your physical heart, that organ that's inside of you, in your chest. That organ keeps pumping blood on average about 80 beats a minute. Between 60 to 100 beats is the average. So you're sitting here, and you've been sitting here for about an hour, and your heart has been going boom, 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 boom. And it does that when you're sleeping, boom, 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 boom. And when you're working, and when you're driving, and with every pump, it's pumping blood that is saturated with oxygen saturated with oxygen and that blood is going from the tip of your head to the tip of your toe boom, 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 boom. and life 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 and more life is continually streaming throughout your body the treasure is that heart that keeps pumping life the cross of jesus the resurrection of jesus boom, 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 pumping life into your body. Look at what Paul says in verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus 
may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you three times. Count words when you do your Bible study, because words are repeated for the sake of emphasis. Words are repeated for the sake of emphasis, right? When your mom calls you, she calls your name three times. You don't want to wait for her to call you three times. Every time her voice pitch rises just a little bit longer, there's some emphasis going on. Life, life, life. This treasure, Jesus, death and resurrection, is life. It's life. It's life. I think of Christian as he flees the city of destruction, plugs his ears, and he races to the cross. And you know what he's screaming? Do you remember when you read Pilgrim's Progress? Life, life, life. God breaks the apostle so that the Corinthians can see that life is not found in Paul's morals or Paul's uh, energetic behavior or his moralistic teachings. God breaks the apostle so that the Corinthians can see that life is found in that treasure. Paul, what sustains you? Christ, Christ specifically dying and rising, sustains me. You see these things in these verses, in verse 10, where you see death, just put the word crucifixion. And where you see the word life, just put the word resurrection. Always carrying in the body the crucifixion of Jesus so that the resurrection of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to crucifixion for Jesus' sake, so that the resurrection of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So crucifixion is at work in us, but resurrection in you. Brothers and sisters, there's no resurrection without a crucifixion. The two stand together as the same, two sides of the same coin. Paul sees in verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus is an enduring reality. It's noteworthy that when John sees a vision of the Lamb in heaven, it is the lamb standing next to the throne, quote, as though it had been slain. The lamb in heaven is one who has just been slain. That we might remember that, that Christ's death is an enduring reality to us. That we might indeed remember day by day and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper that his death has brought us life. He paid the debt we could not pay. He suffered hell which we could not. We would perish. He suffered the taunt and injury, the shame and the ridicule. He suffered all the wages of sin. And in his death, he gave us life. That life is sealed, solidified, and affirmed in his resurrection. So brothers and sisters, this is God's method for ministry. He made the apostle low. He showed him to be a clay jar so that the power of the cross and the empty tomb, those two components side by side, might emanate life. Life in Paul. He was always being cast down. He was always being persecuted, perplexed, and crushed. But what rose him up every time? The cross and the empty tomb. There is hope for you and me here. There is the gospel here for you and me. We must be conformed to the cross if we will be conformed to the resurrection, the empty tomb. And I want to encourage you, encourage you and bless you with a little word that Paul says here at the end of verse 11, right in the center of it, rather, 
We are always being given over to death. For Jesus' sake, you know that your trials are for Jesus' sake. The small ones and the big ones, not just those associated with persecution. The trials, unless there are things that you've, you've, uh, you've done wrong. If you go steal a vehicle and you go put in prison, that's on you. But the sufferings and trials of a broken world and being a clay vessel in a broken world. Ultimately, you suffer that for Jesus. Loneliness. Uh, job insecurity, job loss, physical pain, loss of a spouse, a wayward child. All the trials that you experience are for Jesus. Because when you are brought weak and brought low, then Jesus can show his power in you. And it doesn't mean that you just rise up and dance your way through the house singing cheery songs. It's much more strong than that. It's rather that even in a tear-stained face, you can say, and I, with Job, Job says, you know, even though he slay me, yet will I live. And I know that I will once again stand on this earth, and with my eyes I will see him. That's fortitude. That's surpassing divine dynamite. Brothers and sisters, Paul concludes, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but life in you. This is so encouraging. When What Paul is saying here is that gospel ministry is an incarnation of the cross. You duplicate that. Parents, sometimes parents get so distressed because, you know, our children see us weak. They see us broken. They see us struggling. They see life happening to us. They see... Th Mom and dad are like a clay jar. They're really fragile. And, and, and uh, you know, they're, where is this happy, clappy, triumphant Christianity? The best thing you can give to your children is showing them that in the place of brokenness, you find solace in Christ. That you're not tough. You're not Mr. Tough Guy. You're not Mr. Know-it-all. But you're actually like, you know what? I'm broken. And but God is my Savior. And Jesus died for me. Paid my sins in full. And I live because he lives. Live that way. Live the gospel. And your children will see surpassing power the surpassing power of Jesus Christ. This was God's method for Paul. A cruciform apostle preaches a cruciform Christ, showing the glorious treasure, that treasure of Jesus that works with surpassing power, communicating life. May God do that in us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. A lot of us are, are on the side of being broken right now and being crushed right now. And then some are on the other side of, of rising and, and moving forward. Wherever we find ourselves, Father, let us know that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That it is intrinsic to the cross that there is essential divine power to heal and restore, to save and forgive, to make new. Make us new. Give us life through this treasure, the treasure that you have planted within our hearts. 
Father, if anyone doesn't know this treasure, doesn't possess it this morning, will you by your grace plant it deep within their hearts? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.